I shot a big velvet buck in Ohio, which is uh, kind of unheard of. It's a uh, he, he had a uh, I think some kind of a testicular injury or something was up. His nuts were messed up. Yeah, he's a a Caitlin <laughs> Caitlin Jenner type deer, <laughs> and so he never. The Hunter Podcast is brought to you by Deer Grow. Man, it's almost food plot season, Jared, and Deer Grow is one of those products that has really changed the way that we plant food plots and the success we've seen from them. No doubt. I've been, you know, trying to plant food plots my, my entire you know, whitetail hunting career, which is a little shorter than yours, but the minute that I started or that I, you know, I realized that I could get Deer Grow back into some of these remote plots where I couldn't get lime or fertilizer, especially in the 50 pound bag, you know, format, mm -hmm. so everything was changed. You know, I could get into these spots uh, moving forward with a, with a backpack sprayer and that since escalated to these 40 or 60 uh, gallon sprayers and we're doing upwards of you know five to ten acre food plots just with your grow and having phenomenal success yeah and i mean with the price of fertilizer lime diesel everything this year i mean what better way to get in there and grow a successful food plot at about a third of the cost check out deer grow at deergrow.com and we're back Ew. on our podcast episode 120 welcome back nick had gas he got here not like stomach gas but like car <laughs> gas <laughs> <laughs> Did you, you've seen you've seen Dumb and Dumber, right? I have. They said, "Did you hear those? Those guys must be professionals. They call me the gas man." How do they know? How the hell do they know I got gas? <laughs> I haven't watched that in a long time. Oh, that's a great it's a classic, movie. man. Classic, classic. <laughs> Anyways, it is uh, what is it? March twenty third. Holy cow! It's crazy, man. It's almost April. I feel like March didn't happen. I got like a week till April. Oh, it happened. If you're listening to this, it it's like April's right there. It's a couple couple stone throws, and you're in it. Yeah, we got our April showers today. We got a couple days of rain, and yeah, and now's the you know if you're thinking about those off season kind of plants, now it's starting to get crunch time. Whether it's you know switchgrass or corn or soon to be beans, clover, whatever. Like we're about there. Time to start wrapping up the shed hunting. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. we're we're rounding the corner. I might do some this weekend. I don't know. I've, I guess see what's on the schedule. I've got some showings and stuff to go through, but. Um, might uh might try to go out and uh walk Kentucky a little bit, I think, and maybe make some plans down there. I was gonna actually spray um for switch and corn, but uh, we're getting a lot of rain. We're when, like when's corn go in? May? End of April. And that that early. Depending on soil temp and where you're at, but down there April? probably end of April. Really? Oh yeah. Yeah, I guess in, in Kentucky maybe. Yeah. Beans, beans don't go in until May. Mid June. May? End of May. That seems early. Oh, well, I mean, if you're trying to stagger them to have greener beans, then yeah, you try to push them into June. But down there, it's end I of think, May. I think typically, if I'm remembering correctly, like June 1st, I typically get those in. We, we don't do a ton of them. Before Memorial Day is, is usually the plan. I mean, farmers are in as soon as it hits like 65 When's degrees Memorial soil temps. Like end of May. End of May. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, that, that sounds end right. Of, before end of April, corn. Before end of May, beans. That's usually yeah. your plans. Get them rolling. Yeah. I mean, the, the struggle on, on my place is like so much of it is farmed. Mm -hmm. You know, we have like, I don't know what it is. It's a couple hundred acres under yeah under crop lease. And so like, I just don't have a lot left to work with. Like initially, I, thought, I don't know if it's as critical either for you. I mean, that, that <sighs> I well, think, even look I this last year. I mean, you're you have corn standing through what December in some places. Yeah, yeah, but right after, it ain't nothing. Because mm -hmm. they've already eaten our plots. They're gone in end of November, mm -hmm. which is not good. You know, right. and then, yeah, you know, maybe we have something left standing. But it's it's cleaned up by the end of December, you know, typically mm -hmm. not any later. Yep. So we've got January, February, March, you know, to keep these things rolling and keep them on the property. And the season goes clear through January. So, yeah. I mean, my you know, Garnet, I was tagged out in November. Right. But our late season stuff is, you know, come January, we, we don't have anything left. Yeah, I mean, because I'm planning on putting in a lot of crops, summer crops this year, especially in Kentucky, a little bit in Ohio, and then standard fall. Well, here's what I'm going to do. Um, this was Scalma's advice. He's like, dude, you need to work into your contract with your with yep. your farmer that you can buy back X amount of acreage at their cost. Yeah, I think he buys back like 20 or 25 percent. Oh, I mean, that's a ton. But I know, I'm just saying that's what he buys back. Yeah, for, for us, I mean, it would be 10, 15, 20 acres at the very most. Mm -hmm. You know, and I'd pick, you know, five acre corner. I tried to find somebody in Kentucky, and I still <clears throat> might be able to, but it's getting late in the season. I was going to find somebody to just farm it, charge them no cash rent, and just ask them to leave mm -hmm. 20 to 25% where I indicate. But, you know, 
not all of it's farmable acreage. Some of, and I don't know if yeah. I want it all in farmable acreage. Like I want some cover. I want some switch. I want some fall plots. I'll tell you what, dude, no, no matter what you do, go out there and, and aggressively cut as many trees as you can. I, yeah. I, like it's, it's literally night and day. Like the places that we've timbered recently on our places, mm-hmm. um, just that's where the deer are at. You know what yep. I mean? It's to let that sun get to the forest floor just opens it up. And that's it. That, we'll have that in a discussion here in one of these pods, maybe the next one. But, um, you know, a lot of people I think are very hesitant to cut trees, you know, and I'm one of them, you know, just cut it. It's not coming back. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and at least not for the next 30 plus years. But, um, I think that, you know, you're not looking at clear cuts, but I mean, it, it is critical from a deer habitat standpoint and lots of, wildlife to to be able to open up that canopy and really get some sunlight well down. and for, to take an extreme stance i think clear cuts your best case scenario for, mm-hmm. from, from a purely wildlife mm-hmm. standpoint yep yeah y- yes you want to keep you know if you have mass bearing tree if you have you know you have oaks and stuff you mm-hmm. need tree stand trees mm-hmm. you know in theory mm-hmm. um so it's not a complete clear cut but uh it's the balance between wildlife timber value what's the fa- what's the property for yeah. are you planning on selling it are you planning on keeping it like, yes there's lots of of twists on that one and yeah. now's a good time to do it um in fact now's a pretty good time to get a lot of foresters out there because it's too sloppy for them to cut so <clears> this <throat> is about their downtime where you're, you're out of winter where it was frozen and they were cutting it's before summer where it's dried out and they're cutting this usually this wet season's a good time to get um you know forest or a logging company out there to take a look and at least tell you hey this is what you have this is what i cut oh would you look at this look at oh, that. you look at that yeah <laughs> call jed jed colwell up yeah yeah, yeah. You're, you're you're right. Now's a good time to get out. But um. so, anyways, um, we've got a pretty cool guest today. Uh, we've tried to track Mike down a little bit here over the last few weeks. Busy guy towards the end of the season for sure. Yep. Um, but you know, uh, yeah, I saw that. It was like it's a gnat or a mosquito. Gnat. Um, but you know, I think one of the cool things that probably we saw this year, you know, from a social media standpoint was a lot of Mike's, uh, drone deer recovery videos. Um, you know, for sure, uh, uh, kind of a hot topic and and hot piece of content when he was out there flying and, and, you know, what will be interesting is we've talked to guys, um, uh, like Shane from a tracking standpoint, um, and you know, what he's documenting and, and seeing as, as he's running his dog for blood tracking and stuff whole different type of recovery system here to say you know mike what are you seeing yeah on that well, side d- i'm excited about this conversation because because first of all M- mike seems like a great guy the, yep. their, their business he's is an ohio guy ohio guy yeah so we like him already <laughs> his, his business uh you know at least for face value what we can see from the outside looking in has exploded and like uh i, I assume they have they have more requests than they can even get to but sure. but also because we've had a lot of recent experience with um, I put a bad hit on a deer this year, ended mm-hmm. up using a dog to recover them, mm-hmm. have some mixed opinions about how that kind of went. Mm-hmm. Um, but as real estate agents, we both have our drone licenses as well. Yep. Um, and you know, we're, while we're flying seven, $800 drones, mm-hmm. uh, you know, Mike's, I, I think he said like their, their base models, like 15 grand or something Holy cow. for the, and he, he can fill us in on uh you know all the all the you know the goodies the extras that you can put on it and, and what a final product looks like from that but well, i mean you see um, these videos and so, it's it's amazing that to see you know see the spots that he highlights oh from dude a thermal, it's crazy and then like the zoom in to actually see the deer and be like oh yep hit him in the shoulder it's like what it's like what you would you know it's like five five ten years ago it's like exactly what you would have wished for you're like man yeah. if i could just from an aerial if i could just have a, a thermal vision to show me where it's at yeah and, and like that's what well, they deliver think about when you're tracking a deer and i mean a wounded deer tends to go into some of the thickest nastiest stuff out there right and you're staring at this wall of things that deer could be i mean how many times have you tracked a deer that you've literally walked by it multiple times he's just buried in the thicket over here you got off blood you walk by him you walk by him you walk by him all of a sudden it's like what the hell there he is it seems like it should be so simple like when you look at a map and you're like okay i've grit i've gritted this area like he can only be xyz but then when you go out there and if it's just you or you and a couple guys and you realize like how thick the habitat is it's like it could be anywhere could here. be anywhere and you do walk by them often especially in grid searching um you know he's tucked in behind a log you think it's white belly up and he's really died on his side and you're not seeing the white belly i mean lots of things that change that so yeah i mean mike and his his team have absolutely thrown a huge twist into recovery in a positive way and so it'll be interesting to kind of get his take on that and what he's seen and and i'm really intrigued to see what he's even been learning about you know 
these wounded deer behaviors and yeah. stuff. Yeah. Um, cause like we talked about it a while ago, like, oh, you know, wounded deer, you know, goes to water or yeah. whatever. Like, do they? Yeah. Well, or just, you know, the things that leave us baffled, like, you know, d- dad hit, dad hit a buck in Kansas this year that, yes. that, you know, we, we can go back after the fact and see this, this blood and we're like, well, here's dry blood. Here's wet blood. Here's, we literally here's two beds. points. We're like, did he go back and forth? Did he cross the river? We had no idea. And, you know, unfortunately, ultimately, we, we didn't Couldn't recover that deer. And, uh, you know, I, I don't well, know. Large blood here, large blood here. This looked fresher than this, yet nothing back inland, only the river to cross, of which we assume that's where he went, but nothing on the other side of the river. So did he die in the river? Like, we, we don't know. Yeah. Um, and so though, there there's nothing worse. And, I mean, there'll be people listening and say, oh, I've never lost a deer in my life. Cool, dude. Well, then you haven't shot it enough. You know, anybody who's lost a deer, it's a sick feeling. I've lost them. It, yeah, me too. It will happen. Uh, it happens to to everyone at some point. If you hunt long enough and you hunt hard enough, you know, it's it's just a fact. And so, you know, there's nothing to be ashamed with it. You always want to try to be ethical and make that harvest. But, you know, shit happens, essentially. And so I think listening to kind of what Mike's found in his, you know, essentially firsthand experiences from a whole different view could probably help you on the ground. If not being able to get in contact with Mike to be like, Hey man, I need some help finding this deer. Yeah. Yeah. And, and there's, there's a cost associated with it. I mean, he's going to, he's going to tell us like what it costs to come out and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I've got a, a rough ballpark on it, but like dude, dude for me, you know, it, it's the same methodology with, um, I mean, really any equipment, but, but trail cameras, you know, bows, things that, you know, are expensive, high ticket items. Mm-hmm. When you consider how much time and effort and, and thought process goes into, um, you know, to killing a mature or, or, you know, even a specific animal, the traveling out of state, the gas, yeah. all, all these extra costs. This extra cost, you know, to, to bring in a tool that uh, gives you a, a much higher percentage of uh, recovering the animal that you put in so much work to shoot, to, for me is a no brainer. I'm like, where do I where do I swipe? It's a culmination. I mean, you owe it you owe it to the animal to do everything in your possible power to recover that deer. Yeah. You know, and there will be deer. I'm sure Mike will tell us there'll be deer that he's found that you know are still walking today, like it wasn't a fatal hit. Um, but a, a lot of times, you know. Um, Frankly, blood tracking is hard for a lot of people, especially on poor shots. And so there's a lot of deer. I mean, think of the number of deadheads just in the last couple months of people shed hunting that have, have been found. Yep. I would say the vast majority of those were from bad hits. Um, some from cars and other things, of course, but a vast well, majority of those from and, bad hits. And good hits. Yeah. And good hits. Dude, I think too, too often people are like... Uh, you know, they're not bleeding right away or they push whatever up. they, they get down and look right away and they're like, ah, oh, he's not dead. Yep. Yep. No, he'll be fine. Yeah. Did you put one in that cavity? I mean, that deer is dying, you know, it's just a matter of how you handle it after that. Okay. Well, let's get Mike on. All right, buddy. How are you? I'm doing great. Well, do we appreciate you coming on this morning and, and talking a little bit of, uh, firsthand experience, you know, I know you could kind of hear Jared and I there in the opening and, uh, you know, it's one of those things that, um, again, it's a sick feeling and, and most hunters will experience it sometime in their career, hitting a deer, you know, not necessarily want to, or, you know, even like Jared said, sometimes hitting him in the right spot and listen, these, these things are tough ultimately, you know, yep. big mature buck is a tough animal. Um, yep. and so, you know, I, I think that a lot of people, you know, try to draw uh, conclusions too quick. But, you know, in your experience, you know, how many of these deer that you're coming across are, you know, actually dead somewhere versus, you know, maybe still alive hours and hours later? Uh, 50% of the deer that I look for are still still alive. Wow. Um, I I would say that um, the 50% that are still alive, maybe only... uh, a quarter of those end up uh, dying from a fatal shot later after I leave. But uh, for the most part, 50% of the deer that I'll look for are still alive. Um, and if we evaluate them good enough, usually those bucks will uh, return and come back at a later time. Yeah. Is that a higher number than you would suspect? Or are some people oh, calling yeah. and saying like, uh-huh. hey, I don't know if this thing's dead. We just want to know. Yeah. 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 So when I started, I was like, dude, like, can I at least just find a carcass now? Because <laughs> I've been finding all these deer alive. Jason, my uh, partner, 
he he came on at the end of the season because of workload and he started flying a drone and literally the first six deer that he went and looked for he found them all uh but they all were still on the hoof um they were you know they weren't in good shape but yeah they you know in fact were not dead yet oh geez do you it when you get these calls from, from a hunter, you know, and obviously we've all kind of tried to replay it, but in the moment you get wrapped up, uh, you know, are you finding more uncertainty of the hit or more of like, Hey, you know, I'm pretty sure this deer's dead. I just can't find them. Yeah. It's usually that I, I think the deer is dead. I yeah. just can't find them. But, uh, then in turn, once we locate the deer, it's like, Oh wait, I hit him there. Yeah. And uh, it, you know, it, I, like I said on every other podcast that I've been on, it's like, you know, when we, when we shoot at a deer, um, there, there's so much adrenaline going on. And I think we think we know where we hit him, but really when the shit hits the fan, like there's a lot going on right Mm -hmm. at that time, for sure. If it's like in the rut where majority of our calls are coming from, you know, that can happen just like that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, I, I, um, I really, like that this technology gives us a whole new perspective of how we can uh, you know analyze shots and start collecting data on you know deer that are still alive uh and where did they go when they they were still alive because you know dogs are good they can track but you can't see the deer usually and you can tell well he kept moving you see we bumped him but why why did we bump him yeah you know where so Mike, break us down a little bit, everybody listening, um, the kind of the technology that you guys are using. I mean, obviously we, we know it's drone, we know there's thermal involved, but, but give us a little bit of a breakdown. You don't have to go into super specifics on, you know, what is the technology and even, you know, wh- where did this, where did this thought process come from on your end? Yeah. Well, the technology is, uh, thermal imaging drones, but just big ones, not something that, uh, you know, just everybody in their garage has. It, um, it's about a $18,000 unit. Um, it has three cameras, uh, has four cameras, but three, we use a lot thermal. Then we have a wide angle, uh, RGB camera, red, green, blue, blue, and then a zoom, uh, lens as well, where we can zoom in and see if that's the deer you hit or not. So basically we, we find them with thermal and then we zoom in up on them to see if that's the deer that you hit or not. Of course you as the hunter, will have to tell me right. if it's your deer is I, I won't know yeah. um, if you have a picture or whatever, but where did the thought come from? Um, really? I I've always liked RCs and I've flown RC airplanes my whole, um, you know, <laughs> young life. And uh, I've been flying drones, like camera drones, like you guys were saying earlier, you guys probably have, you know, like DJ camera drones for your yeah, yeah. really. Yep. So I was doing that. And as the technology progressed and got better and better with thermal imaging and then the bigger cameras on these drones, I was talking to a buddy one day and we were talking about um, thermal drones for roof inspections. And I told him I thought about getting one to, you know, find deer. He's like, I think it'd be a good idea. So I (laughs) took that advice and went and bought one. And basically that's how it started. It was just a, it's just a thought and an idea. Um, Yes, there was a lot that I was thinking about, like legality. Is the community going to support this? Sure. Um, naysayers and that type of thing. But you know what? In, in the end, it's it's about us <clears throat> as operators, like what our intent is. And mm-hmm. our intent is to use it for good in the community. It, we have no ill intent whatsoever. So, right. um, yeah, that's that's really basically where it started and when on those camera side of things um you know obviously that let's let's say the zoom camera because i've seen a lot of the videos where you're locating it usually with a thermal and then you're kind of going back and doing the zoom to see again probably give that hunter uh an understanding of it's that deer i would assume that you're doing most of your searches then in daylight hours no 90 percent of it's at night really so how how does the how does the zoom camera then come into play in the evening time and it has a IR. It, it has does IR, have IR. But, uh, when you're when you're at 400 AGL above the ground, um, the IR uh, beam yep. or it's, you can't technically see it, but the the light that it's uh, trying to illuminate yep. that it's uh, big enough to illuminate at 400. 
So we have an extra spotlight on top of the drone that we use to Makes sense. help them. The, the fact that you're doing them at night, is that by choice? And is that because of the temperature difference between the, the body of the animal and like, uh, you know, the sun on? Cho- jo- choice. And that's usually when people hit their deer is evenings yeah. and, and want to look for them and they want to look for them now. Um, so then we go out, but the, the more I've done this, uh, I figured out that I don't need to be there right away. Like there's no need for me to rush out there and look for this deer in two hours, three hours, six hours, eight hours. It doesn't matter after, you know, 10, 12 hours, maybe it's starting to become a rush to get out there. But, uh, yeah, it's usually because people want me there. I'll Mm -hmm. come out. Do you, do you, I mean, cause obviously unlike, let's say the dog aspect of things, or even just, let's say a, a group or a party search on this thing, you're not putting the pressure on the ground at deer level. Um, so, you know, I guess unlike those other things, you don't really have to worry about, Oh, if I get there too early, right. I'm going to, I'm going to mess it up or do anything. It's just, if it is a poor shot, the sooner you get there, the less likely that deer's dead. Correct. Yep. Correct. Yeah. You definitely aren't putting any pressure on deer. Right. Um, <laughs> We just did uh, did some stuff with Todd Graff, and he's like, he could not believe how little these deer actually are aware of this drone, yeah. Um, you know, flying around. Everybody's trying to say like, well, the deer are going to hear it and get scared. That's not necessarily true with our drones. Like, we're not flying these little ones where the prop speed is super fast, and you get that high pitch, um, yeah, sound. Yep. Uh, our our props are bigger, and so they don't have to spin as fast. So the drone doesn't um, pitch off that, uh, loud sound usually. Now, if it's super windy, yeah, you know, 40 hour winds or something, and the drone's really fighting to stay in one position, it might get a little loud, but you, you have to remember that we are at 400 feet, usually right around there, 380 to 396, uh, above the ground. And that's way up there. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. 98% of the deer have no idea that we're around. Well, huh. and, and dude, where you're at in Ohio and where Jeremy and I are at here in southwestern Pennsylvania, oil and gas is, is big business. And there's freaking helicopters, you know, and, uh, you know, on the military side of things, doing flight trainings and stuff, like all the time. You know, I've been yep. in a tree stand and a helicopter flies like 50 yards over my head and it's like, <laughs> yeah. you know. So yeah, they, no, I mean, just an airplane um like i also fly airplane it's like those those engines alone and the prop noise coming off of that is is louder than our drone oh, is, for, for sure. sure yeah for sure yeah i don't i don't know how to do like audio tests like with uh so you can tell how many decimals and yeah. stuff but if uh, we should do that and we might do that on on a oh, video at some point you could easily dude if you just get a a, a decibel tester yeah so you buy it on amazon go out and stand with it yeah. And fly the drone up above you and, and around you. And you can mm-hmm. tell probably exactly what it is. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think yeah. it's the, it's the lack of understanding on, like you said, kind of the, the actual physics of that drone, because people immediately <laughs> think those small drones and how much noise they make. Well, Mike's <laughs> got this huge ass drone. Like how much noise does that make? Right. But they don't understand, like you said, around the prop aspect of things and the speed that those props have to move. And there's other mm-hmm. factors like wind in it, but you know, the, it, it all comes down to immediately, anytime new things like this come into play, people want to go and claim wildlife harassment. I mean, that's the thing. And, and yeah. let's be honest, there are people abusing drones for inappropriate reasons around the wildlife aspect. Yeah. And they, and they, and they've been doing it before. Absolutely, before, man. You know, drone every went public and semi-viral. It's like that those people that are doing that will do that it doesn't matter what the heck we we put in, in yes. law black and white they're still going to be bad people yeah well yeah i mean if you if you say hey you can't fly a drone anymore over wildlife there's if as long as drones are available they're still going to do it yeah <laughs> so so mike you mentioned as, as you're getting into it and, and i want to also hear a little bit more about like your your licensing procedure like your history with with aviation and all that but you mentioned that um the legality like was a big consideration as you were getting into it uh, and we've just heard people talking about like and we've questioned ourselves we're like is that legal like c- can you do that where can you do that um you well, know, even ha- around the thermal side there's certain states yeah. that you can't run on the ground right. thermal for it so does that apply to the aviation aspect of it yeah 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 i mean th- th- that's a valid uh question on the thermal side of the, as far as the aviation aircraft side of what we do um it just is it's so gray like 
in most states that it doesn't tell you. Yes, it, it'll tell you no aircraft in the aid of hunting. Okay, before it, I say and this, this is I'm not state kidding. by state, Mike, or federal? Uh, state by state. Okay. Um, I'm not giving legal advice when I speak of, you know, how we are <laughs> We doing never this. do. No, <laughs> but, you know, um, so when it talks about aircraft in the aid of hunting, you go to the definition of hunting and you figure out what is the definition of hunting. Mm-hmm. That's really where we are different because we're a service. We have no intent of hunting that deer that we are looking for yep. whatsoever. Mm-hmm. And when we're there, the, the guys that have called us out, they aren't hunting. No weapons around whatsoever. We are, um, yep. you know, we're really just doing an evaluation evaluation and trying to find a carcass is yeah. what, uh, well, and, what we're and, up to. And, you know, 50% of the time, it sounds like you don't know if you're hunting or recovering. Yeah. Yep. You know, you, you go out with the intention of recovering, which sounds like is, is not really mentioned in the rule. I mean, that is the service, I, I would assume. Yeah. Like, ultimately, when you're called out there, the the service is to locate and, you know, aid in the recovery of that, not aid in the hunt of that deer. I'm yeah. Sure. yeah. yeah. Sure. I mean, you know, the, the wardens that I talked to, they, they did mention, Mike, you know, just don't use this to cheat. And it's like, <laughs> I, I, won't, I don't care how much money you're going to throw at me. Um it's like, I, I'm not just doing this for the money. It's because I love it. Yeah. And uh, so if you plan on calling me to do something sketchy, no, not going to do it. So what yeah. about in a, like a scenario, because um, this is common in wounded animals, right? Let's say you go out, you fly it, uh, deer's located, still alive, whether it's bedded on the hoof. And like the, the ethical thing is, especially if it's in bad shape, is I need to put a follow-up shot on that. Where, where is that line? And, that, and that's exactly what you would do if you were just blood trailing it on your own, had a dog, if you came up on it. You know, the only difference here is you're using, you know, a drone to get to that point. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that um, each hunter has to make his own uh, decision on what he wants to do um, on that because it, it's bad seeing a deer uh, yeah, suffering absolutely. Like when you see a drone and then... And then to think that um, I wrap up, right? I wrap up, I go home, and the guy's like, well, I'll just leave him suffer there for, you know, the next 12 hours. Yeah, it, you it can't does, do that. Ethically, ethically, that does not make any sense at all. You've already put one arrow or bullet in him. My opinion would be, um, you know, try to, Finish try to do off. something to get patch soon. Yeah, and I mean, obviously, I think, we're, like you're saying, it's up to the hunter. There's a, It's subjective, but... Quickly, I'm sure when you locate an animal, you can say or you realize like, hey, you know, that shot wasn't good and that deer is going to be fine. Well, Shoulder, correct. high, yep, yep, whatever. So that, that- I, I've seen that where it's like, you know what? Um, when I first started, when I first started my first 10, you know, 15, 20 deer, I couldn't tell or or I didn't know what I was looking sure. for really as far as in the uh, demeanor of the deer. But now as I've done more and more, I, I tell the hunters, even on the video, sometimes I, I feel like I might come off a little cocky. I'm like, dude, this deer's not going to die. Don't worry about it. He'll come back. Well, th- that's and, your experience. Uh, I mean, think of how many observation experiences you've been able to have where most of these guys, you know, maybe they've tracked one or two wounded deer in their life, and they probably never saw how that deer even behaved or where it was actually hit. They never found it, right? It's it's a mystery. Yep. And yep. That, what a tough line to walk. I mean, literally, it's it's the decision, you know, using the drone to, to you know, once you find the deer, probably the most valuable thing you can find out other than where he's at is where they're hit. And you can use yeah. that to make a decision about if they're going to die or not. Um, and yeah. that that right there to then make the decision of it's it's a lethal hit. You know, we're going to either sneak in and put another arrow in him to finish him off or, you know, he's going to expire. We can see that from from what we're seeing here. The alternative would be, we found him. We we see the shot. I don't think it's a lethal hit, but we know yep. where he's at, and we're gonna sneak in and try to put another shot on him. You know, I think that that yeah, subtle difference you know is the. I, I, I most guys don't do that. Like, I wouldn't think just, so. I wouldn't think yeah. so. I'm I'm telling you, like it doesn't matter what type of technology we we take. Um, let's say thermal scopes, right? When those came out years ago, you know, probably the first big fear was like, oh, now everybody's going to go out and shoot the bucks at night. Yeah. Like, but most people are still good. Yes, yeah. there's some bad ones around, but majority of us have 
no ill intent and we just want to use it to benefit um you know the sport or whatever i, I would think to you man especially you know you guys have uh i'll let you talk about pricing here at some point but it's people that are willing to pay a price for you to come out and give this service i, I want to believe are the same people that have a lot of respect for the animal's life and just yeah. you know they really want to do the ethical thing and so i, I think that yeah. makes perfect sense what you're saying yeah totally what what states are you guys operating in uh currently well so we started in ohio yeah. Um, and, 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 then we, and it's just you, Mike, or how many guys are on your team? Well, uh, I have one, two, three, four, four pilots okay. in Ohio that I can go to and, and more now when I, when I say this, it's the first season, but right. you know, everybody that started seeing this on social media was like, I want to do that. I want to do that. And then we were like, oh, geez, we better start some kind of program because I was getting leads all across the country without any marketing. Um, I was getting Texas, Iowa, Illinois, Indiana, Wisconsin, you name it, the calls were coming in. And then I was like, there's a demand here for this service in almost every state that has uh, hunting. And we started a program. We were going to do like a school where we teach you online how to do this. Uh, excuse me. Um but now we're doing a licensing deal. <laughs> Basically, uh, people will buy the drone from us. And they will come here and I'm going to train them everything I know. And then we're going to send them leads. So it's like a franchise, we, right? Yep, it's kind of like that. We are in uh, 10 states now and have 14 operators. Wow. That's awesome. All right. You well, know, you know, by heart, we'll, can you we'll start <laughs> making that stuff public on social media here in a little bit, but okay. we're still working on it. Do you know them by heart, Mike? Can you rattle them off? No, what by heart? What states you're in? Uh, I don't know them all. No. Ohio. Pennsylvania, West Virginia. Yep. Uh, don't think West Virginia, New York, New York. New York. Yeah. Uh, Michigan. Indiana. Uh, yep. Indiana, Illinois. Don't know on Illinois yet. Iowa, Iowa, Missouri. Yep. Uh, looking at Missouri, I should have Kevin here. He he does the uh, the license. That's all right. I don't mean to put yeah. you on the spot. Kansas. <laughs> uh, yep. Kansas, Nebraska. Yep. Don't know about. I was gonna say yet. Wisconsin. Wisconsin. Yep. Yeah. Wisconsin. Well, I mean, you look at the guys. look at look at where your your highest and I, this is kind of weird, but look at where your highest deer hunter numbers are. Yep. Frankly, that's where the most wounded Minnesota? deer are also going to be. Yeah. <laughs> Minnesota. Like, yeah, that's just how it you're, is. You're, yeah, if you're not in Minnesota, you forget. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Is Minnesota good? Yeah. There's a lot of hunters. There's there. a lot of hunters. It means yeah. there's a lot of wood. A lot, a lot of arrows getting flung for yeah. sure. Yeah, it's yeah. slinging. Yeah. Man. Same a, with Pennsylvania. A, is wanting to do it in Minnesota. I think she'd be really good. I, Hopefully she comes it would, it would be a good it would be a good say. What um what percentage of the of the tracks or the calls do you get are bow crossbow over gun? I would assume <laughs> a, a high number or are you oh, getting yeah. primarily uh, archery, right? I, I would say ninety eight percent. I was gonna are, say uh, yeah, not not many from a gun side. Well, it's it's a much longer season. Well, it's just yeah. where the deer go. You know, you shoot a deer yeah. with a gun, it falls. Well, no, <laughs> sure. I yes and no. I would uh, agree with Jared. It, it's just such a short season. Yeah, like and you know, most guys aren't taking off the whole week. They're they might only go three four days and then you know call it quits. Yeah, yeah. that makes sense. <laughs> hmm. Well, Mike, can we uh, can you talk us like run us through a scenario? Um, like if you can, like if, if I wanted to, to get in touch with you. So, so dude, I shot a deer on, uh, November November third or second, second, third this year. I want to say it was second or third. And, uh, I, you know, I was one of those guys in this scenario where I, I didn't hit the deer where I, first of all, where I wanted to. And upon recovering it, where I thought I hit it, it was much further back than I thought. Um, mm -hmm. But so I shot that deer at like 5.30 in the evening and it was warm. It was like 70 degrees. I literally shot him in street clothes. I was wearing a t-shirt and, and like jeans. Um, it, the, it was just, it's a long story, but, but basically, you know, this deer come out following a doe and, and I whacked him, hit him, hit him back. And he ran across the food plot that I was hunting over and uh, stood on the other side of it for, I'm going to say a, like a solid 10 minutes. Like I, you know, as soon as I shot, I looked at my watch and I watched him stand there for, for 10 minutes. Um, not a lot of tail flicker and not a lot of head bobbing. Nothing that gave me a really strong feeling like that deer's going down like within, you know, soon. Uh, mm -hmm. then eventually he walked off and, uh, you know, I was, I was kind of sick about it. I was like, 
I knew it was a dead deer. You know, even you put it in them guts, that they're dead. Mm. You know, I'm shooting a, a mm-hmm. big two blade expandable broadhead. Um, I know, I know it's a dead deer. It's just a question of, and you probably run into this a lot. It's like, how do people handle that situation? Like without putting pressure on them too fast, you know, who's the right person to call first? Do I go look for blood? Do I call a dog? Do I call a drone? Do I, you know, just yeah. start, start gridding? You know, people have all kind of different scenarios. Um, I ultimately ended up calling a dog. <clears throat> uh, actually what I did, Mike was I, I backed out and I, I just gave him the night. I said, uh, I'm going to go back in the morning and hopefully find blood where he was standing for 10 minutes and hopefully find him, you know, laid up dead within a hundred yards. You know, if I can follow blood from that point, um, went back the next morning, no blood. I mean, there was uh, a a little bit where he stood for 10 minutes, but for standing for for, for 10 minutes, you'd hope for a lot more blood. Mm -hmm. You know I mean? It's very, very little. Uh, And I don't, not a drop, you know, outside of 10 yards from that spot. So, so basically, you know, deer was gone without a trace. This entire property is a thicket. I mean, he, he could go anywhere. Um, so at that point I started plugging into calling dogs, you know, I called, called two or three different people, ultimately found one that was able to come out. So you must've not known about drone deer recovery at that time. I didn't know about it. Yeah. I had no idea. Um, and I, yeah, I, I'm pretty sure yeah, I just well, had no idea. And again, per our pre-podcast talk, like you guys are <laughs> 45 minutes apart. Yeah, yeah. Well, and obviously that'd be my my no brainer go to at this point. But so rarely do do I even call in a. Do- I don't know if I've ever called in a dog. Before. We haven't. We we've always. I mean, anytime it's usually people. Like we call in p- other people to help people, us. You know, usually or, we, you know we make good shots in most cases. You know, <laughs> yeah. we're typically able to recover it. So so for me to call in a dog is like I really wanted to to do it right. And uh-huh. well, and stop you there. And no res- disrespect to the dog tracking, it was difficult. N- number one, very few and far between. Number two, to get them there, and especially like you were saying, Mike, during the rut, it's like there's how many deer are getting hit, and frankly, yeah. not being found. Like there's only so many <clears throat> resources that can be right drawn into those. Well, of the three or four people that I called, uh, you know, all but one said I'm I'm busy basically. Yep. It's November third. I get it. Um, you yeah. know, and people have to drive and stuff. <laughs> At least the dog found it for you. If well, you know, <laughs> we did find the deer. Um, I have a v- very mixed so the, opinions. The dog did track up to the deer. <sighs> yeah, you know, I've got dogs. I know how to read. I've got two Brittany Spaniels, but you know, I'll yield to you know the handler knows their dog better than anybody. So if, if they say, "Oh, it's doing this," it's doing it, I, I trust you. We, you know, we went off on some some wild, you know, some directions that I'm like, he didn't go this way. Like I'm just telling you. And, uh, eventually we did find the deer. Uh, it was, he was laid out in the middle of a field down in the bottom, ki- kind of where you'd expect him to go. Um, there was, hmm. like, there was like a few indications where, you know, it was actually, it was a female handler. She's, you know, her name was Summer. She, awesome. Awesome. She, she brought her kid out, you know, their dog. And, uh, she's like, the dog wants to go across this, this dam here of this little lake. I'm like, okay. And that was the property line. Um, so, so I called and, and got permission and sure enough, that dog was, or that deer was laying right across the dam. It was right on the other side. So I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> like it, 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 frankly, there's not a places, a lot of places that we could have gone. It's like you either go across okay. the dam or we go back into it's this. It's a big thicket. funnel down into the bottom. Yeah. And so I don't know. I got to give the dog some credit, but I, you know, yeah. I don't know. I wonder how many deer you busted out doing that track. A ton. Yeah, I'm sure. Well, and, and yeah, to, to Mike's point, it had, let's say Mike was available, <clears throat> did you would have put that drone up, you would have turned it one time and be like, oh yeah, there it is. Oh, it would have been, it, 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 it would have been over. There it is, there it is. On YouTube like that, <laughs> and I felt so bad for the guy because he, he's been tracking this, he's like, he's sweating it, he's like, I can't find this thing. Yeah. And I take the drone up before I get started, right? I just do a quick scan if there's fields around, like those don't yeah, yeah. take a second. Yeah. And I, I, I'm like, no way, I zoomed in from like <laughs> 800 feet. 800 feet away and i zoomed in i'm like no way that's your deer he's like uh uh-uh. yep there he was out in the field well wow. see i would be okay with that because usually if if i make a poor shot yeah, who wouldn't I, be? I normally don't even like maybe i i go for 50 yards or so but if i know it's a poor shot i'm out of there i'm, I'm backed out so if i've made that call to you you know and he you find him in an open field 100 yards from where i was sitting like awesome man like you know that's just as big of a win for me as if i would have walked 100 yards and found him i don't care oh for sure you know i would have rather have not pushed him you know versus that and so i guess that was that's the real question is what what do you do like i think 
Yeah. No, no, yeah. Nobody, you know, nobody has a plan for it until it's you know, three, four hours after you've made a bad shot and you're like, who do I call? What do I do? You know, um, that's what I was going to ask Mike. I assume Mike, most of these guys are attempting to find the deer, can't find it. Then they call you. Is that accurate? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and of course we'll probably say the same thing as the dog guy would is like, call me um, first. if you don't, if you are on a trail and it's somewhat not good blood yep, and you've gone past a hundred yards, just quickly Get pull out. out because we start bumping that deer, even with the drone, it is a lot harder to figure out where they're going. And that adrenaline gets going yep. and it just, uh, yeah. they just go. So, um, I would say if you can't find your deer and it's some point, co- some point, uh, kind of iffy yeah. on the, the blood trail that you're doing uh, after a hundred yards, just call us right away. If you do that and you don't bump <laughs> the deer, Oh, I am. On, I'm, I'm, so freaking confident that I'll find the deer, yeah. but whether he's alive uh, or dead is on the hunter. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yep. So, yeah. so in my scenario that I laid out for you there, Mike, I would have, I, I would have probably called you that night, you know, cause I shot the deer at five 30. I knew, for, first of all, I, I was very confident it was a lethal hit, but I wasn't confident in the deer's reaction, like to, to know that he was going to be bleeding a lot or that I'd recover him quickly, mm-hmm. like within a hundred yards. So I would have called mm-hmm. you that night. Um, and just, you know, made contact, say, Hey, I hit this deer, uh, you know, it's warm, you know, so I, I want to like, you know, I'd like to find this deer by tomorrow at noon type of deal. Um, yeah. and I suppose at that point you would have really tried to, to find out more information about like where I hit the deer and like, you know, yeah, is that- yeah. I, I'm asking those questions, right? Like I asked, is a crossbow, a compound, a mechanical fix, uh, that type of stuff. Not that that's going to change how I search. It's just data I want to have because yes. in, you know, in five, ten years, if we if we can collect this data and see some type of trend or or whatever it might be, it's probably just for personal. But um, there is a lot of viable uh, information coming oh, yeah. from that. Uh, you know, if I ask you your arrow, crossbow, compound, longbow, whatever that I can, uh, I can just store and, yeah. you know, well, and five I, years down the road. I said, Mike, that. you've seen, you've seen the diagram. Like I, I think of the f- four dogs that I called, I think three of them sent me this diagram. They're like, where'd you hit them? And it's yeah. like, you, have you seen that diagram? Yeah. Uh, yeah. But, but that's where you think you hit them. Where yeah, sure. did you actually, right? Sure. Like, so, cause uh, I mean, if I do that to everybody as well, I mean, it's a great tool, like probably, Hey, I kind of think I hit him like right here, but, um, what I've already found and seen and showed people on the videos of what they told me yeah. where they think they hit him. And then I show them with the, uh, the drone. It's like, well, that diagram wouldn't you done yet any good. Anyhow. It is funny, dude. Like it seems like, you know, there, there's all these questions and like, you know, we can, we can try to reason as much as we can about it, but the, the drone is just like the God card. You're like, it doesn't matter. I'm going to throw it up and we're going to find it. <laughs> like, I don't care what you shot at, whether where you it shot it, matter. I'll tell you where yep. it's at. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I say we're gonna find it if it's within a thousand yards if your deer is uh not within a thousand yeah. yards it's live and it it'll yeah, be yeah, it'll be fine yeah how, how many I, i've come to uh figure out so far right i want to do more and more but um these mature bucks that get shot in their home ground if they get hit and i can't find them past you know in that thousand yards they literally will move and I've got proof of this because I've, I've had uh, hunters like keep me updated. I was like, dude, your deer's not here and he's going to come back. And they're like, no, this is where he lives. Like he's been here for, you know, weeks and months. And I'm like, I know what you're saying, but this deer is not here and he'll be back. And then, and then he shows back uh, in like two to three weeks. Mm-hmm. Why do you think that is? It is really bugging me. Why the heck? these deer actually move away from their so-called home grounds when they get hit. When I mean, they get hit. I mean, I I, well, I'd have to feel like, I mean, again, they chose that home ground for multiple reasons. One of it, especially for the mature bucks, being safety and security, right? They get old for a reason. As soon as that is violated, in the case of being wounded, that no longer feels like a very safe territory to them. That would su- mm. surprise me. The same way it is you, Mike, I, I wouldn't have suspected that either. I would think that they would go to like their safest spot and, yep. and, hunker, and down. hunker down. But you're, yep. you're saying you haven't seen that? You see them leave a lot? 
Yeah. Yep. If they, uh, if they're alive, um, you know, it, it's a shot that isn't really painful or something like that. Yeah. They will Flesh wound away. type of thing. Yeah. yeah. I bet that's what away. it is. I mean, I, you know, they chose that place, that's especially crazy. the mature buck. There has to be other resources, but they choose that spot because of the security and that's how they get old. And I think when that security is violated and broken open, they're going to get the hell out of there. Well, now, eventually, I think they probably realize, like, maybe where they went isn't as good as that. Or, you know, there's some sort of lag in the the memory there that they end up making their way back. But, I mean, think about it in your place. Like, if somebody, like, if you're at your house and all of a sudden somebody breaks in, like, you don't feel secure in your house unless that person's caught or, or you know that that person's been removed, right? Yeah. yeah. So you yeah, maybe I, you go I've stay in a hotel before. or with a re- you know with a relative what? or whatever it might be. Yeah, with a yeah. relative. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that's that's very interesting and kind of contradictory to what you would think of like uh, with, with a mortally hit animal. I think in most cases, and maybe Mike, you can confirm this as well. They will go to the, like their security cover. Mm-hmm. Like they're just they they're only going to be alive for you know the next fifteen twenty. They go to where they can, like yeah. their closest, safest area. But if they have like the wherewithal to know that, like to know that, like uh, oh, I didn't like that something something really bad happened. You know, like you're saying, maybe in those cases they can have the gumption to like leave well and mike i mean that data on your side i think is that's a critical point here for people to listen to because again let's take your technology out of it right go back before you were doing this the fact is if i went and searched for a deer and i can't find this deer the next two weeks my cameras in that area have not seen that deer immediately i'm like damn it that deer's dead and i screwed up and he's he's gone right i mean because that's the thought process you know, whether mm-hmm. you then shoot another deer or season ends and you pull, right? Like, the expectation of seeing that deer again and, and really the guilt of thinking, well, maybe it was lethal and I killed him because he left your area. It's not like most of us are running enough, you know, observational cameras or hunts to cover, uh. you know, a square mile. Like, we're, we're just yep. not doing it. Yep. You freaking got it. Like, I'm telling you, guys, as we get more and more into this data, we are going to learn so much more about the the deer of how they react to a shot that, I mean, shit, I was so confused at times when I was doing this. I'm like, this makes no sense that I can't find this deer. I believe the technology. I know I'm not missing. I'm not missing anything. But where the heck is he? Mm-hmm. Like, would I have to literally fly two miles away or four miles away in these directions to find the deer, because I can cover some ground. Like, um, you know, we're within line of sight of our drone, but I can still see the drone a mile away. Yeah. Um, sure. covering those types of areas. So yeah, it, it's going to be cool in the next few years, what we get. And do you do that at all? I mean, I know you're saying with, if he's within a thousand yards, I'll find him. But if, have there been scenarios where, where the guy's like confident that it was a lethal hit or something where you, where you push those bounds? Mm, only if they pushed him like for a while, like they bumped kept, him, like, yeah, just in front of him, just yeah. in front of him. Um, I did find one that they they pushed him one point two miles, uh, from where I found him. Uh, but it was like a hit that they they thought maybe if they keep pushing him, that yeah. they'll you stumble up on him. But yeah. every time they did that, he just. I don't know, was it adrenaline or, or what? That he needed time to stay down for a while. Well, um, and I would say even think about, like, so this buck that Jared and I tracked a few years ago that I hit, I put a single lung hit on him. I mean, deer bled like crazy. And we tracked him for two miles. But if you think about if you would have thrown a drone up, from the point of where I shot him to the point of where he we found him was probably 600 yards. Right. He did a two mile loop almost of which on the ground we were fine. But that's where, again, from the on the ground and the dog versus your aerial, you know, observation, you know, a thousand yards in a in a radius is a giant, giant area. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. He 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 was probably like in between, too. He's like, you know, it, it was a lethal hit, but, you know, he was thinking about. Head, head into Mexico, you know. Yeah, he was thinking <laughs> like, about. I, I gotta get out of here. He was thinking about making it another season, but uh, yeah, but yeah. I mean, that's so. Again, I say that because if if you look at and um, oh, uh, when we talk to Shane, who runs dogs a lot and stuff, like even he said when he's tracking these things, like you may cover six, seven hundred yards, but look at like point to point. 
right? It's point to point might be 310, mm -hmm. but you yep. just were zigzagging through all the thicket and security cover around, oh. a, you know, over a creek, around a pond, whatever. But that point to point is not nearly as far as as it seems. So a lot of times when we start talking about, oh, we track that deer four or 500 yards, you know, yeah, mm -hmm. but it, you know, he was just making a circle and looping right back around or whatever it might have mm -hmm. been. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've seen and heard that while I'm out, they're like, um, you know, they had a dog in before and tracked him for a mile. And it's like, it was maybe a, a mile around exactly. but straight across. It's not near that far. Mike, what do you see on, uh, the, the deer that you guys do find dead successful recoveries? Um, like how far do they typically make it from where either they were shot or, or where they last, you know, stop looking for them? I got to look at my uh, records and figure out exactly how far that is. I, I would say if I just do a quick guess, um, I, they average probably two to 400 yards. Yeah. And is that from if, point if, of impact to point of find, like, you know, as the crow flies per se? Uh, no, I was do, going that on based on where they tracked him to. So I, obviously I want you to pull out a map. Let's kind of see where, yep. where you tracked him, where you think he went. Um, but usually you know people track them 100 yards or or more um before they call us or try to uh, so yeah i would say that's probably from where they tell me that they last either seen him or um tracked him to yeah i think i would be interested in the the ones when you find these deer that are not mortally wounded how often are the hunters in almost denial over like, well, that can't be that deer, or, you know, no, there's no way I, I, that's definitely not where I hit them. Or are they fairly humble uh, with the, the proof that you have right there in front of them? Um, there's definitely guys that don't want to admit it right away, but it's like, I'm not here to make you look bad. Like, that's not my intent here at all. Um, I'm just showing you what, what the camera sees. And, uh, I would say, I don't know. Not really that many. I did over a hundred and, you know, on those, let's say there were, uh, you know, 75 that I found that were hits. I, it, honestly, I would say maybe 10 people out of those hundred were like, really? well, that's not where I am. Well, cause I mean, even like your probably initial response when you walked up on that deer was like, man, I, you know, I didn't think I hit it there. Yeah, you know, that's exactly what thing. it was. Yeah. It was um, way further yeah. back than I thought. Yeah. You know, well, and, and then, then there's some people that are just completely like, humble like uh the big 200 if you guys watched it yep. early season uh big white antlers um that guy he was just straight up with me he's like mike if you ask me where i hit him there's a lot going on and i truly cannot tell you where i think i hit him i just don't know yep. and i'm like okay you know that yep. doesn't change anything i'm just asking you where you think you hit him yeah which is cool and i mean again in, in those cases hopefully those guys like you said, are, are backing out fairly quick and picking up the phone. Oh yeah. That guy, had, yeah. he was not, he, he wasn't had, taking he a step. He's like, he, even, he even has a tracking dog and he was like, no, no way. Don't even look not, at those no woods. Way. <laughs> yep, he's like, I am not entering yeah. that woods without knowing is the deer yeah. dead or not. And yep. he was like, you know, they found one speck of blood uh, on a little blade of grass. And he was like, Nope, stop game over. Come out, get the drone. Let's see. And that was the best thing he ever could have done because that deer was not lethally hit. The deer circled back and was in the food plots later that night, and we, we were able to find him. Otherwise, he already had made plans the next day, if the drone doesn't find him, to take all his brothers. I think he had four or five brothers, and they were all going to yep, uh, great grit sir, sir. And push Yep, push the whole property out. Yeah, <laughs> Isn't that, that so crazy? And that deer would have been gone, that, man. Isn't that so crazy? On such a pure buck. Who knows? Wow. He, he would screw this. It, it, it is funny to code. think about how, like, you know, that's our strategy. Like, if we, if we, like, we spend all year, like, you know, the entire life of the property trying to keep pressure off of it, like, to, to you know, <laughs> don't, don't go into the sanctuaries. And then the, the, you know, the minute that you fling an arrow at one, you're like, well, let's put yeah, everybody in there. Let's it, go man. walk the Just whole thing go, out. Blow it out. <laughs> he's got to be in there. I know he's yeah. in there. Let's push it out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, and I mean, we've done it, dude. We did it, uh, well, in Kansas this year, we yeah. had, you know, the dads hit oh. some and, you know, it's one of them deals where we have limited time. It's like, you have to, you have to look for yeah. the animal. We don't have dogs. We don't have drones. So we walk it out. And then 
the spots burned, but it's like, well, you only have Man, so many spots. So I still like the, the, I've maybe, and I've tracked a lot of deer, maybe one or two deer I've found in a grid search scenario. Like when I get off blood, I mean, the odds of finding that deer just uh, mm. prior to Mike found that, found that one, in grid <laughs> you search. Know. Continue, yeah. Fuzzy Wuzzy. They're still alive. I'll send you a picture of this one here, Mike. I shot a big velvet buck in Ohio, which is uh, kind of unheard of. It's a, uh, he he had a, uh, I think some kind of a testicular injury or something was up. His nuts were messed up. Yeah, he's a a Caitlin, (laughs) Caitlin Jenner type deer. And so he never shed, as far as I know, I mean, I I had history with him as a three-year-old and he was a velvet, like 130 inch eight point. I don't think he ever shed. He, he carried it all year. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah had to build it all year long. Uh, I never did see him in person. Never dropped antlers. But I don't think he ever shed his antlers that year as a three-year-old. I think he kind of hmm. broke some of them off and stuff, but then as a four-year-old, regrew back over them, still in velvet. Um, oh, I had to see this deer. Huh? Because yeah. we got a, you got a picture it's, of him in May. I don't know how to show him. You got a picture of him in May, Here, and he was picture. almost full-grown. Like, I remember you getting a trail camera yeah. picture, and we're like, what? <laughs> Yeah, he was like full grown in in like May, and I was like, "How bizarre!" And this year's got stickers and mass, and I mean, he ended up going one fifty seven with velvet. <laughs> Sounds like a, a crazy looking deer. If he yeah. grew, so he grew antlers over top of his antlers. Yeah, it, so it just like continued to put mass on over top <laughs> of like existing antlers. And again, like Jared said, I think what we said is beams. His beams broke, and his brow tines had like frozen off, and maybe his G two. I just sent it to you. Oh, what? Yeah. What a cool deer. Isn't that cool? Good for you. That was uh, September 20, like 29th. 28th, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Late, late in September. I mean, far after they should have been shed velvet. That is weird. Um, But I bring them up, not just yeah, to talk yeah. about the, the, the The drones are changing now how we do grids because the grids, if you're a, a big time, you know, management guy, don't put pressure <laughs> on your spots. This yeah. is the way to do it. 100%. Well, when I bring that deer up, not just not just to bring him up, but to say that deer, I didn't hit where I thought I did. Um, oh, yeah. I thought it was a decent hit. I hit him uh, back, back and way low, way low. Mm. Um blood I, I thought it was a good shot you know good enough that a couple hours later we went out and uh i saw him bedded on a hillside you know like the, the worst thing that you, you know i walked to the edge of the food plot basically shine shine my light up on this br- brushy hillside and i can see who i'm pretty confident was him bedded looking down at us i've got mm-hmm. blood going up there and so i so i back mm-hmm. out kind of same s- similar deal as the, the deer i shot last year you know i'm a little bit ashamed to admit but it is what it is um so what we did was we went back the next morning again hoping that he'd be laying right in the spot where i had seen him bedded and uh sure enough he wasn't um and it had rained it had rained quite a bit it was it was a drought year too so like it hadn't rained for like three four weeks and then it poured overnight so any blood we had was gone all we had left Mm -hmm. to do was was grid um so we brought in some neighbors and stuff we did exactly what we're you know saying how much we hate to do it but we i brought five or six guys in and we gridded the whole deal and uh, we did find him alive, mm. bedded maybe two, three hundred yards from mm-hmm. from where I had had him bedded, and uh, ended up putting another arrow in him. Um, mm. Well, and again, yeah, that's, that's that was, a that fun line. Act, actually, great for thermal drones is um, if it rains. Yeah. Uh, at one point, you know, I know that I was like, I don't want to shoot something if it's raining because I don't know if it's going to wash the blood away, even if I smoke a, a right. deer. Um, but now. Uh, with thermal drones, if, if you want to go hunting in, in the pouring down rain, we'll be able to find him. Yeah. We'll even fly in the rain. Yeah. Very well, and cool. the thing that was freaking me out about this one was the velvet. I was worried, you know, because when it's not like I'm going to shoot another velvet deer in Ohio. Like, this is it. And, yeah. and I know that the minute that that deer dies, the velvet is going to start to decay. And so I'm like mm-hmm. freaking out. I'm like, you know, and so fortunately it was best case scenario for the velvet in that I had him to the taxidermist within two hours of, of sh- finishing the deer off of killing him. But worst case scenario in terms of, you know, the deer was alive for 12, 15 hours after I shot him. And I, you know, hate that for the deer. Sucks. Yeah, I know it is what it is. It, it happens, but, uh, you know, what do you do? The Hunter Podcast is brought to you by Hoyt Archery. Dude, where would we be without our Hoyt bows? Probably shooting crossbows. Or, or a Matthews. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> One in the same. 
Yeah. But in all seriousness, we love being Hoyt guys because you stand out. When you're in this room full of other people that shoot these other types of bows, I feel like the Hoyt guys just stick out. Uh, dude, it's just a legit bow. I mean, th th especially that carbon riser, man. I mean, I, I know that they've got several other aluminum lines as well. But for, for me, I'm shooting that RX-5 uh, in the carbon model. They've since come out with RX-7. And uh, I can't tell you how much I love being a Hoyt guy amongst a C4 of Matthews guys. So we're out there, I think, pr proving them wrong, shooting 80 pounds and uh, you know, killing stuff. Hey, man, if you want to get serious, get Hoyt. Uh, I guess, Mike, you know, one of the things that, again, let's call it the, the traditional on the foot stalking aspect and, and, and trying to track uh, deer, you hear a lot of things like, for instance, you know, the wounded deer always goes to water, right? I mean, that's kind of like the number one thing. And I, again, as you build data, you know, I think you guys are going to have some really cool insight. But, you know, in your first season, any trends like that that you see that are like, and you know, this, you know, they tend to do this or they tend to do that. Yeah. So I, I tell you what I've told the other guys, the trend right now is there is no trend. There's literally no trend. Sometimes it seems to be going one way and then it goes the other way for mm -hmm. like three, seasons. let's say three, we find close to water and then the next three we don't. So there is, there's no trend as of right now because we don't have an, an, enough data, I think, to even uh, make a trend yet. But sure. I think, um, I think that might just be an old, old thing that, uh, we've had over the years that majority of the deer that happened to be found were by water, mm -hmm. uh, just because for some reason the people walked past the water and then there was a deer. Um, hey, I don't I'll, know that they go to, to water. I'll, I, give you, I'll give you two data points, Mike, to add to your set. Both, both these deer of mine that we've talked about. The deer, the deer I shot last year died right by a pond. He went downhill from where I shot him and died by a pond. Like, t you know, textbook, what you would think. This velvet deer uh, died, you know, 10 yards from a creek. Yeah. But that's just where we found him because, I mean, I found gut, gut shot deer on top of a hill. There, I Shit, I don't even know if there was any water anywhere close. Yeah. But then there's other find uh, down in water. I mean, there. so I've looked... Uh, I did over a hundred calls last year wow. and, um, I've tried telling hunters if I didn't find the deer that keep me updated, I want to know, do you guys find him later? Um, or does he come back? And if you find him later, let me know exactly what area, because I want to know if I look there and what can I change to try to become better. And really out of those hundred, uh, calls that I did, there was only three guys that called me back and said that they found the deer in the area that I looked, um, that I looked in. And one of the guys said he doesn't even believe that the deer was dead when we looked there. Uh, he feels like he went out and then maybe came back later and died from infection or something. Uh, and the other was laying in water. So if a deer is actually laying in water, like, um, yeah. let's say there's that much water three four inches um and he lays in there and his body temperature becomes the same temperature as the the water because it cools down faster i can't see the thermal um mm. body so that deer should have could have found it but i didn't he was literally like 150 yards away from me uh laying in water but i didn't find it hmm. what is the temperature difference like how long does the deer like how long does it take for them to like assume the same temperature as the environment after they've died? It depends on uh, the outside air temperature. So uh, the ideal temperatures that we like to look for thermals, it would say like between 40 or between 30 Fahrenheit and like 50 Fahrenheit, right? Like if it's that uh, temperature out, dude, we'll find thermals on that carcass for 36, 40 hours. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. And I mean, I think that's probably where people, um, people kind of, you know, rush to conclusions. And, and again, it's, you get wrapped up in the moment, but you want to get out there. Like you feel like you need to find the steer or I don't know, coyotes are going to get it. I guess that would be another thing. Like, I mean, well, have the, you found the, the some meat, of these deer the getting meat. into like coyotes getting into these deer as often as people would think? Uh, not as often as I, I was thinking, but. There's definitely deer that um, that got hit by coyotes. There's one deer. He was dying. I mean, it, 
you you can watch the video you'll see the deer um laying like head down everything like he was gonna be there the next morning and the guys went back the next morning and had a coyote track in the bed Mm -hmm. so just before he expired coyotes must have jumped him and got him you know got him up um i went back to look for that deer um with is like now what i know i think i would have found him but i was really focused in the timber to look for the the deer and what i should have done is i should have thought well if the coyotes jumped him in the timber the deer probably is going to go to fields he he can see him coming you know and and prep but anyhow i ended up not finding the the carcass the second time uh because i was looking in the timber and he was just outside in the fields you would think like a deer if he's if he's that <clears throat> like mortally wounded if he's that close that the coyotes would have brought him down like w- you know within 50 yards of where he was bedded yeah hmm. huh so mike you uh you said you did 100 calls last year is that that's just you yeah yeah so well, at the end uh jason picked up uh, some of those but yeah basically one guy one drone so were you a hunter before all this I was, yeah. <laughs> so, so how is yeah, that? Uh, has yeah. that kind of unfolded the way that you thought that it might? Or I mean, what's? I'm sure it's impacted your ability to spend time in the woods, you know. And is that? Uh, oh yeah. Shot? Yeah, I only. I mean, if I really would push it and want to go hunting, I could. Uh, I could go, but I only went for an hour this year. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and so. But- so do you guys like when you get the call you're like uh, i know are you i know you've got your pilot's license you know and you even offered this morning like, i'll fly out and we'll do it in person and <laughs> the, the weather wasn't conducive but i mean do, do all of your pilots have that luxury is that something that you do normally fly out to clients or no no you guys are no yeah that's just uh it's a little pricey flying yourself around i'm sure but, uh, i'm sure yeah um most of the guys that have their remote pilot's license have only their remote pilot's license they don't they're not licensed airplane pilots yep and so you guys primarily will drive then you'll say yep got your call cool we'll we'll drive out and see you like what tomorrow or what's the typical uh time frame uh so i'm already going to probably change that some for my personal schedule uh this coming fall um I will probably push some of those calls out till early morning instead of going, uh, going out searching, say like, you know, 9 PM to midnight or whatever. I'll push those calls out because I now know that it's not a super hurry for me to get there as far as thermals. If the client wants that, I'll, I'll do that. But, uh, yeah. So normally this season, the way it went, you called me and I would probably, be on the road to your place within, I don't know, 30 minutes to an hour headed to your place. Wow. But I got busy. I had so many calls. It was like you'd go in the waiting line, basically. So every whoever called first, I go there and then go around and circle. Yeah. Well, and I can imagine like even just from, from one side of Ohio to the other, I mean, it probably takes four hours to get across. It's like if you got one, oh, one in the morning, yeah. one in the afternoon it, and it, then back. I mean, I, I kind of, you know, the, the price is what it is. So not just every person with a small deer calls, but it, you know, if, if somebody wants to pay or fee, I'm willing to drive wherever. Sure. And so what, what is the price, Mike? So we're 450 to come out and look and another hundred dollars if we find the deer dead or alive. And with that fee includes 30 miles one way from home base. Um, and past that is a dollar a mile. A dollar a mile. Okay. Seems fairly reasonable. I mean, in terms of finding well, that that's deer, what I said in the beginning. I was like, dude, when it comes to recovering, there's yeah, there's no price I wouldn't pay. Well, I mean, even just to, I'm pretty sure I tip. I paid for that dog to come out. I, I yeah, you know, you know, as mixed emotions. I mean, I was stoked to find it, and she was, uh-huh. and they were there to find it. So I gave, I gave them the credit there on the spot. I think I paid them two hundred fifty bucks or something like that. I mean, I would again to to whether it's a recovery or just a location. Like if if Mike came out just to tell me, hey found the deer he's gonna make it like it's not a a lethal hit well worth it you know i mean yeah yeah we we gotta start like you know we're we're talking 450 let's go 550 because we find a bunch of the deer it's gonna cost you five 
550 bucks is not very much when you consider what you pay for your bow, your broadheads, your arrows, your tree stands, your camo, your food plots, your fertilizer. You're tens of thousands. Yeah. And yeah. now you put you put a hit on a deer that you want it to, you know. It's the culmination. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's 550 bucks. No, no I got an idea. Well, you're going to pay 550 just to mount it. You know what I mean? So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and again, I mean, the... There's no one out there who's who's like obsessed with deer and hunts deer that doesn't have anything worse than the unknown, right? What happened to that deer? I don't know. I never found him. I guess he's dead. Like, dude, there is nothing worse than going through a season thinking that the deer you've set your eyes on the entire time is now dead and you didn't find it when he could have. Uh, he could have been alive. He could have just moved. Maybe he is dead and he's right there and you just never walked over there. Like, no brainer. Yeah. Well, yep. well, that's what makes the technology, I think, so intriguing. I mean, you, you see how ate up we are, like with, with trail cameras and especially cellular trail cameras. It's because, um, I saw her sneaking back there. <laughs> it, it's because, you know, it's, of course, it, I came out in the shop and, and they came out here. Oh, so. it's, it's totally yeah. fine, man. Um, it's uh it's like revealing this like underworld of of deer that we're like i never knew they did this before mm -hmm. um and so you know it's it all culminates to this shot or this opportunity and to like have that same ability to like reveal what's happening now after the shot like for years and years it was always a mystery i don't know that deer got away it's you know blood you yeah. know countless stories you know mm -hmm. more stories than there are probably success stories and like you guys are offering a service that's like you know puts a spotlight on on those unknowns you're like here we go here's the answers yeah you know, yep. pretty it's cool. cool um it, you know we talked about kind of the state-by-state -state legality of this you know i think one thing that people would be interested in is obviously you know, and Jared and I are in the real estate size. You talk about like the real estate, the airspace above, but what about on public land? Can you use this and find deer if somebody hit one on public land? Well, I think all public lands are changing. Uh, Ohio just passed a, well, not just that, that they're voting on it in April that no drones are allowed to be operated over any land that is governed by the ODNR. Hmm. So, I guess supposedly there were anti-hunters bringing their drones in, finding hunters in tree stands, and then would bring their drones down and harass the hunters. So a lot of dead drones on um, the ground. If that was me, <laughs> yeah. and that's so, wild. Uh, that that's so now they're, they're voting on that, and it will probably get passed because I was talking with one of the wow. uh, council members, the wildlife council members, <laughs> and basically I think that every state will start make making new laws on uh state-owned grounds i think private grounds will be okay for a while um but as they see the intent just like dogs you know when it first started there's um there were states that said no you can't use dogs to track to locate or recover yeah. a deer um but as it got more popular and they seen the intent that the sportsmen actually want to use it for good and not for bad um, they legalize it. So we're going to see the same thing with drones. Um, right now, everybody that calls their state guys, they're going to, no, nope, no, nope, can't do it illegal, illegal, which is not necessarily mm. true. Um, they're going to tell you that because they probably don't know exactly what, uh, what is allowed and what isn't. Sure. Interesting. Yeah. And I mean, in, in you know, Kansas obviously just did the public land trail camera thing. Well, you dude, know. I don't, I don't understand. Like, especially Ohio. Like, and, and I haven't spoken personally with any of the council members. We'd love to get them on, mm -hmm. but like, I can't understand how you would make something like, you know, in the state of Kansas, tr the trail cameras things illegal. And, and I know there is a difference between private and public land, but um, like, we see all of this like liberalization of like, uh, you know, hunt, hunting opportunity, uh, opportunity. Like, so in Ohio, Mike. You know, I can shoot a deer with a straight wall, a straight wall cartridge over a corn pile, uh, you know, that I've been running a cellular trail camera over, right? But I can't use a, a drone potentially in the future to, to recover my animal, you know, or even, you know, like you said, uh, use a dog to recover the animal. Like, that makes no sense to me. Like, I, I would much rather see them crack down on these things that are, uh, you know, just t turning deer into fish in a barrel, essentially, um, and at the same time acknowledge 
that services like you're offering with the drone and like, you know, deer have offered here in recent years, um, that those things, the intention behind those is, is good. Whereas, you know, the other is, yep. I, I, well, can't, that's I can't the, say that's the, the reason with the, the all encompassing laws, like per this, Mike, obviously your intent of use of a drone is not why they're creating the drone ban over, you know, the airspace over these ODNR land. That's so crazy to me that they would, they would make a law to protect hunters from drones. That doesn't make any sense. And it's the hunter harassment. And I don't stuff think that's right. Nobody's going to vote for that. It'll get passed. You just wait. That. You just wait that when, when, uh, uh, a nature lover, right? He's not a hunter is out there watching something. And, uh, there's four deer hunters that walk right past him. Oh, he's harassing me because he's tracking a deer or something like, yeah, it's- sure. Yeah. Well, th- that's, that's a more likely thing. I, I just, I can't see a state voting to ban drones because it's affecting hunters negatively. I just don't <laughs> see that happening. Yeah. I, I just, I'm a little pissed at myself because we were so busy. We couldn't go to the uh, council to meetings the council, and give yeah. our opinion on why we think it shouldn't. But yeah, well, we got, we got other things now we got to do with yeah, uh, the council yeah. and, and the states, but they can um, still put we'll Chinese get- spy balloons over those damn properties. Yeah. Right. Come on. Right. It, it is. It's, it's these, um, and listen, no, no pick on any of the DNRs and stuff, but these kind of gut reactions of like giant broad based bands and laws, right? Yeah. That's, that is the issue here because again, like when you throw something like that over, it's like, okay, well let's say, um, let's say Ohio state university wildlife decides that like they need to do a research project over ODNR lands to do, um, surveys on deer or turkeys or predators or whatever. Right. Uh, can they fly drone over that? Is there an exemption there for them? Like that's the, you know, by, by law it should know, but I'm sure there's exemptions and there's loopholes, but not to the general public or to the small businesses, to the other government entities. Yes. Yeah. I don't know, dude, don't, Mike, I would seriously question, like maybe, maybe I misheard you on that, but like the more I'm thinking about it, there's just no way that the state of Ohio is going to ban drones because non hunters are affecting hunters hunts. That's not happening. Oh, you watched the meeting second Tuesday in April. They're voting on it. Watch the live stream. That'll be the justification. Well, Just like in- that's the justification. The reason they're doing it is because they don't want Mike out there finding people's deer with drones because they think that it's uh, cheating. Yeah, that it's illegal or that no. it should be illegal. For, the problem is they didn't even know about drone deer recovery before this even started. Hmm. <laughs> Where can I watch this meeting? It'll be on their website. No, what- the ODNR live uh, stream on YouTube. Okay, it's the second Tuesday of each month is usually when they meet. And you can watch all those meetings. Mm-hmm. I, I think most of them. Yeah, are they're all live stream. It's like wow. the the game commission one here in Pennsylvania. We watch where they were doing the Saturday. Yeah, they're and like, Sunday we hunting. hear what you're saying, but we're gonna do the opposite. <laughs> we're gonna just we're gonna do this. <laughs> we, I, we get it, but we're not gonna do. It. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, it's um, yeah, it again, and it comes down to the. <laughs> My yeah. side could just just come and bitch at him then, because see, we can go too, right? Right? Yeah. Like all of us uh, have access to these meetings. Yep. We can go and we can speak and we we can give our opinions, but most people don't. Yeah, we, we forget, or, or or we, you know, yeah, we're just like it's held here in Wildland and Tuesday. At a, it. Yeah, it's held Tuesday at eleven a.m. People are working. They're like, well, too bad, yeah. <laughs> can't take yep. off work. Right. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. it. Um. You know. I think that it, there's definitely a a move, and I'm not sure. You you see this domino effect happening. That's a big piece of it. There's a move for a um. I don't even know what it is. A, a restriction of technology in this realm. Like, I mean, that's where the. I mean, look at all the western states banning trail cameras, and now Kansas is doing it on public lands. Missouri's already done it on public lands. Now Ohio's banning drones. Like there's a, a big move here to do this. Now the question always becomes like, who the hell is going to enforce it? Right? Like what good is the law? If anybody can like, <laughs> right. to, your, to your point earlier, Mike, do you, do you really think that the person who wants to actually do hunter harassment with a drone is going to just not fly a drone over it because the ODNR <laughs> says that they can't No, They're going right. to do the same damn thing that they were doing before. Yep. <laughs> like it makes no sense. Yeah. 
Well, dude, and, and to the, the broad stroke comment, I mean, it's like, uh, I'm trying to think of an analogy, but like, <clears throat> in my eyes, like if the main problem, like in a state like Ohio is the scenario I laid out for you, the straight wall, the mm-hmm. corner pile, mm-hmm. you know, t- t- to impose something like making the drones illegal is like basically not solving the issue at all. You know, it's like, we, well, we'll correct. do this. And yeah. people are like, oh yeah, that's good. We call this the bait and switch method. The old bait and switch. <laughs> Yeah, let, look over here, look over here, don't look over here. <clears throat> that's yep. that's what we're looking at at this point. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I've got some stuff on my side, just in Ohio, anyhow. Um, there is, the council members actually like what I'm doing. Uh, they, they How do. couldn't they? I mean, it's it's literally for the best of the wildlife, which is what they work for. Like, yeah, yeah. they want to keep hunters happy and these other stakeholders. Your job is to preserve and conserve the wildlife populations. It in the probably state of Ohio. scares them though. They probably they probably want to like make sure that it's regulated. They want to like, hey, Mike, we you know we like what you're doing as long as the intention's good, but like we need to make sure you know you're not yeah. uh, harassing wildlife or whatever you know whatever they could happen. Yeah, yeah, <clears throat> but harassing wildlife is federal. Like Correct. that's not state by state. Um, harassing wildlife with any type of aircraft well we're at the state level hunting with aviation you know using aviation in the Mm -hmm. v8 of hunting would be there yeah yeah Yeah. again a law is only as good as it's regulated yeah right enforced like can you imagine how tough this is going to be if 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 it actually comes black and white can't use drones to recover carcasses no no i'm not even going to go there i was going to say how no go there Can you like? H- how can they tell if you're actually looking for a carcass? And they I'm not can. looking, for, like, for my child or something. Yeah, my kid's yeah. missing. He's just walking well, around in the okay. woods. So, dude, in, was it Utah? They just banned the shed hunting, and so like, yeah. they're like, "How do you know if I'm out here just recreating?" And I happen to, I'm yeah. like, "Oh, here's a shed, <laughs> right?" Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree, it, dude. You're getting too too nitty gritty. It's not they're unenforceable it, laws. It's like setting you know undocumented, unachievable goals. It's just it's pointless. And for what reason? Yeah, I mean, for yep. what re- like, what is truly a ban on cameras on public land in Kansas going to do, or what is truly a ban on, you know, uh, no drones over ODNR lands in Ohio? Like, what is that accomplishing? What do you think? There's going to be air wars over top of these these, mm-hmm. you know, ODNR managed lands? Like, what are you talking about? Like, Mike just told us it's an eighteen thousand dollar drone. Like, you know, people people don't have eighteen thousand dollar houses in Southeast Ohio. <laughs> Yeah. Like yeah. what the hell? Yeah. You know, it's it's you you can't. It's just I I don't understand where these guys are coming from or who is starting. Like who is literally getting enough behind? Like I don't know a petition. I guess like it, right to it, to move it to this level. You have to say something to get them to even start looking into it. I mean, dude, uh, we're pretty tuned into the hunting community. I haven't heard shit about hunters being harassed by drones on Ohio public right, lands. Right, what? I said the same thing. There was a guy that walked up to us at the Mount Hope Expo and he showed us what the next council meeting is going to be about, about this uh, no drones over ODNR. And Joel, I was like, whoa, whoa, like, shouldn't we know about this? We have a business in this. And he's like, well, the, you know, we don't really get told this stuff until it's like pushed through. Until it's already been <laughs> and, voted uh, on. Yeah, who's been, that, who's been complaining told. about it? Yeah, you guys wouldn't even know about this uh, if I wouldn't have said anything. Exactly. And, then, you know, at some point down the road, there's going to be this law that, oh, I didn't know that's a thing. Yeah, it wasn't a thing until just eight in April. That's why I'm telling you it's bullshit. Well, and that's where that's where Missouri's camera thing got me. Like, you know, how was I supposed to know? I used trail cameras on public land in Missouri for years. And then somebody said, hey, uh, just so you know, the new regulation book came out and that's not in the book. So technically it's illegal. I was like, what mm. What are you talking about? That's mm. what I'm saying. Yeah. You know, and, and who makes, who, who is bitched enough for it now to be at the commission level to be put into a law? Like, <laughs> like, I, cause I mean, and I say that in a weird way because you see a lot of these petitions per Pennsylvania go back to Mondays, not Saturdays, whatever. There's tens of thousand people signing that thing before it gets brought to the commission who still says doesn't matter we're going to do saturday mike if, if you've got connections with like the, the commissioners whoever's voting on this stuff dude we we want to help like we you know i think we've got some pretty strong opinions like certainly here in pa but <laughs> the fuck ass part about it is i asked wait wait can i come and tell you why it shouldn't he's like unfortunately we're gonna be voting on it 
uh, the first thing when the meeting opens, so you can't even technically talk until we voted on it. Where's the public opinion part of that? Well, it was. It was January, February, March. And we missed it. Yeah, well, I never heard about it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> where, do, where do they promote this stuff? I would assume they, right. like, I would assume they don't, don't promote it because they don't want they don't want people coming. They didn't come on our meetings. podcast and talk about it. I mean, that's I mean, that's, you know, we, we you know, we bitch a lot and, and we do need to give them <laughs> we need to give them some credit. I'm sure there's like some there are some it's people. The whole point of this podcast, though, is we try to talk about shit that people don't talk about or don't want to talk about. And it's just because debate is good for the community. It's good for the industry. Well, just even for- knowing about it in the first place would have been helpful. Like, come on a podcast or come on a social media. There's and, no way. And advertise the fact that this is, you know, something that's going to be voted on. Like, I guarantee you this is the first time any of our listeners are hearing about it. Yeah, well, get ready because it's coming. Uh, well, I'm it's- going. I, I mean, I'm going. I'm, I'm still going to I'm still going to give my opinion. Hopefully, you know, hopefully it doesn't get voted in and uh, I can talk after after yeah. the fact. And I would love to see the evidence of all of these cases of hunter harassment by drones that led to this potential law being put in place, because I feel like, you know, that would have made dude. some sort of wire. Well, dude, a, a bit of it is a dog and pony show too. I mean, they they hold these like public meetings. The decision has already been made, you know, <laughs> and they basically need to go out there and save face for the local politicians so they can say, "Well, we're fighting this," and you know, because we got so and so. I'm a hundred percent serious. I know for a fact that's happening, like with the solar panel stuff, and in your part of Ohio. Mm-hmm. Um, ultimately, the decision's been made that private landowners have the right to put solar panels on our property. All of the locals who don't want to look at solar panels are going to have these these public meetings, and the local politicians are going to host them. And, and you know, the first time it'll get passed, it'll say, "Yeah, you know, it's you know, uh, it, it's a detriment to you know the the uh, property values in this area and X Y Z." But ultimately, dude, private landowner. Uh, rights will prevail and uh you know it's 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 a dog and pony show in that in that sense yeah i i yeah i guess i should have taught if if i would have known sooner i would have put it out on podcasts well Uh, and i mean that's the thing is it's 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 swept under the rug it's kept hush hush until essentially they look at the freaking crossbow thing like dude who voted on that the people that spoke out against crossbows like in pennsylvania and where's eberhart from Michigan. Michigan, you know, all these states where it's legalized now, like all them guys basically were like threatened by like their employers and stuff. They're like, you, d- you don't talk about this because the decision has been made when the, the, the checks were written by the crossbow companies to, uh, you know, the, the people who are influencing those decisions. Yeah. It's just like any poly. And there, all of a sudden it's like, who's everywhere. this guy walking through the woods rattling? Like, oh, crossbows are illegal now. Well, interesting. <laughs> Yeah, I mean that's just how it is. And funny enough, in se- in plenty of states, you know, they're like, oh no, yeah, you have to have like a permit to show that you're like, you know, have issues. And- <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> right, right. I mean, the the world of lobbyist is is one that a lot of people are very unfamiliar with, or or just turn a blind eye to. But man, there's a ton of money, you know, from a state level to the federal level in the lobbyist arena to get agendas pushed through. I mean, that is the oh, yeah. job. Like, can you imagine like how much money you could make if you know a law is coming and you invest in a company or, or take money out of something because the law could make you tons of money? Pretty sure yeah, Pelosi did Pelosi, that. Pelosi, <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> of course, electric vehicles are going to be mandatory by 2030. Yeah. Well, I mean, dude, generally, like every politician, like ever. I mean, it, it, you know, they, you look at the senators. Do they get paid like two hundred thousand dollars a year? They're all worth like multi millions of yeah. dollars. Yeah, it's not from their salary. The Hunter Podcast is brought to you by Stealth Cam. Dude, where would we be without our cell cams? I would definitely be divorced at this point. <laughs> yeah, I hear that. I mean, the fact is, is I spent more time checking cameras than I actually did hunting prior to cell cameras. Now at least my wife can enjoy me being in the comfort of my own home, buried in my phone checking those pictures. Yeah, 100%. And dude, when it comes to uh, trail cameras and definitely cell cameras, reliability is, I think, the number one thing that we're looking for. Stealth Cam just has a long reputation of reliable cameras, and ultimately that is the most important thing to us. They have to work. In terms of reliability, there's not a better camera on the market than Stealth Cam, whether you're talking about the Fusion X, the Reactor, or the DS4K Transmit. And most of them are under 200 bucks. SouthCam.com. Check them out. Well, you know, Mike, I think the the thing that's, you know, first of all, it's an 
awesome opportunity for people to kind of hear that you guys are expanding, you know, from a brand and capabilities uh, geography wise, um, because, you know, there's only, like you said, look at what you did last year. There's only so much that, that you can do and travel to. And even per like Jared talking about the tracking dogs, like, you know, on, on November 3rd, I'm sure there's, you know, what, 20 deer within a, a few County radius that are getting hit and somebody needs help tracking. Um, yeah. that's, that's just, it's so concentrated, um, it, which is, becomes a limited resource, you know? And so I, I think though, that what people have to realize is, you know, everybody just says, well, you know, I have to go look for, or I have to go do this. They don't look at the alternatives very often. And obviously you guys are an amazing alternative for people to truly find out what happened at deer, probably the best alternative. I mean, a dog isn't necessarily going to tell you if that deer is going to live or not, or where he went. I mean, it's not, it's not going to happen unless he's dead yeah. or you bump him. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's going to be cool. There's definitely big things coming. Uh, I'm excited about it. We were a little bit of, um, a crap shoot trying to get it all organized on how we're going to do licensing training. And, you know, we had hundreds, thousands of emails coming in. People wanted to do it. We couldn't get back to him for a while because it was just um, me and two guys. And so if anybody's listening to this, that reached out to us and we haven't reached yet, I'm, I'm sorry. It's just, there's a lot going on and, and we're trying to get organized and we'll, we'll have operators in, in all the popular States for yeah. sure. Mike, are you doing this full time now? <laughs> it feels like it, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm doing. Uh, I still have a tree company, so okay. yesterday I I did trees, but uh, every day it's something with drones. Yep. What kind of tree company? Uh, residential hazardous tree removal, so yep. around uh, buildings yep. and that type of thing. Gotcha, Mike. I think you're the first Yoder on this podcast, my knowledge. Or is there uh, is there some Amish uh, descendants there? Yep. Yeah, my uh, my whole family is Amish. I'm the only one that isn't. Oh wow! Gotcha. How about that? I did not know that. Well, so well, you couldn't hear it in my uh, accent, huh? No, uh, no, not at all. Okay. I must be getting better. Yeah. Right Look at it. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yep. So, so what does that mean? I mean, do you, do you live with your family, like, and they are all, you're like in an Amish community, or you're to totally separate from the community? <laughs> No, this is my property. My parents just happen to live right next to us. Okay. They sold me, they sold me, uh, uh, the farm and, uh, yeah, I guess I live here. How do they feel about all this thermal drone nonsense? <laughs> oh, they're way cool. Like there's, <laughs> we could get down, uh, down, uh, a road on how this Amish thing works, but it's, it'd take a while. An another time when you fly your, your, yeah, airplane that, out that would be an, a good <laughs> in-person yeah, yeah, podcast. Uh, we can, we can definitely plan on coming back and talking about more different type of stuff. But I, uh, I get that question a lot. I think I got to make a YouTube video on it. Um, like who am I and how did I get into drones? If I grew up Amish, I went to eighth grade education, you know, I'm not super smart, but I like technology and that type of thing. Hmm. So uh, what, how, kinda... when did you, I don't know, leave Amish? <laughs> is that the, is that the term? When did you break Amish? Um, I, uh, so I was never worth the church. So you like joined church, then yeah, yeah. you were technically Amish. Uh, but I grew up in a family till I was probably 17. I would have lived that lifestyle, like the clothes and yeah. the horse buggy and that type of thing. So when I was 17, I chose to not live that lifestyle. How, how old are you now? How old do I look? 30. Younger than me, older than Jared, I would say. 33? 31. Yeah. So there you go. I'm 30. Jeremy's 30. I'll be 39 soon. Mm -hmm. yeah. What? Yeah. You, I would never guess you. Yeah. Who? You You look young. Jeremy? Yeah. Yeah. Is it no. Mike? It, 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 God the, damn it. Uh, so I like I'm Mike. Looking straight, right? <laughs> you're looking at me? You're, you're Jared. Yeah. You're Jared. Yeah. yeah. Jeremy. Yeah. Yeah. I'll be 39. 30. I'll be 39. And uh, you thought Jeremy looks younger like than 39. Weeks. Uh, it looks like it on the screen. Uh, yeah. Not from where I'm sitting. I told you I liked Mike. <laughs> yeah. He's a fucking great guy. <laughs> you do look you do good. Though. We, yeah. <laughs> uh, let's get this Yoder down here, man. Look, come on. Uh, shit, that's funny. Well, listen, yeah. Mike, we took up a bunch of your morning, man. We, we would love to have you in studio at some point. I think it'd be really cool. And I'm, um, you know, uh, I'm really interested as you start to continue to gather data, right? I'm a data nut myself, but... 
those patterns, those trends, you know, even I, I know it's, you know, call it a small sample size, but the fact that you kind of see, you know, Hey, these deer leave takes a little bit and then they come back. I mean, again, makes sense. Somebody breaks into your house and they're yep. not caught. Like you're going to go back and stay there the next day. Probably not. You're going to let yep. it, let it go for a few days. You're going to figure out an alternative. Um, so I think those are things that, you know, should be some revelations to kind of people listening to this to, to oh, yeah. not get too and panicked. Five years from now, we're going to have a lot, lots more data because, you know, just the operators that we're picking up. Yep. We're, uh, <laughs> that's going to double, triple, quadruple our uh, well, information. You may, see, you may see variations by different geographies, right? Wisconsin yep. deer may be different than what yep. Iowa deer do and because of pressure yep. or whatever else. So Yeah. Very cool, man. Well, we, like I said, we appreciate you coming on, and uh, we'll we'll definitely be make sure we get you down here to P. Well, I mean, it's short hop, skip, and a jump actually for you to to get down here. Yeah. So. Cool. Awesome, man. Yeah, appreciate the time. And awesome. Yo, Mike Yoder. Yeah, man. Breaking Amish. I didn't. I didn't. <laughs> yeah, what we were talking about. I didn't realize he was like first generation breaking Amish. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think it's a whole nother, <clears throat> sounded like a whole nother conversation. I'm interested. Yeah, I'm interested as well. I want the donut recipe. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure those people aren't real on this. The homemade that's, donut. <laughs> have you ever had that's called donuts? Crisp, those are, that's called Krispy Kreme. <laughs> Amish donuts? I don't know if I have. Dude, there's an Amish shop like right next to where I live. In Somerset? And, uh, yeah, Shanksville. Yeah. And they do Amish donuts every Saturday. Yeah. And they're so good. What is an Amish donut? I don't know. They're just like a regular donut, but they're like fried in something. Like it's Amish oil. Maybe I don't want. I don't know if I want to know. But. I keep thinking King Pan, King Pin when he's milking milks the bull. Yeah. That's what it's stuffed. We with. don't. We don't have a cow. We have a bull. <laughs> <laughs> oh shit! Uh, well, that was really cool. I mean, it, it, it's funny because you know, I guess he's right. Like it, it's been a season for for drone deer recovery but i mean think of like how often you see this stuff especially during the season i mean dude i was glued to his stuff when he was searching for these deer and what he's finding yeah. and zooming <clears throat> in and i mean um how could you not be i mean it's 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 the mystery of like what happens to a deer after you shoot it if you don't see it go down is like essentially being like the curtains being pulled back on it by you know by mike and his team some pretty good takeaways there i mean again he's continuing to build data but you know past a thousand yards probably aren't finding it. Deer's likely making it. Yeah. Um, if they leave, you know, it may be a while before they come back. So don't jump to conclusions that they're dead or something else happened. Um, you know, just even those right there, I think is super valuable. Yeah. Um, I, I thought it was interesting too. He said what, you know, up to basically 72 hours, it will still throw a heat signature, um, mm -hmm. which is wild. Like that gives you a lot of time. And again, uh, you know, ultimately I, even though we kind of, debunked a little bit on like the hey these deer go to water or whatever per his data right now um and i think shane also shane simpson also um kind of agreed with that like it, there was no real data no real data yeah. supporting it i think that there the the age-old one that does hold true is when in doubt back out mm -hmm. you know because i mean it, ultimately if you don't if it doesn't feel right get out call him He's going to throw it up. He's going to find that deer. It's going to be, if it's going to die or it is dead, it's going to be within that thousand yard radius. Mm -hmm. um, and so that still becomes the no brainer is don't pressure it. Don't pump it. Don't grid search it. Like those are, you know, those are last resorts after him, if you can get him out there. Mm -hmm. um, and now with what sounds like expanding his team and his operation to multiple States, I mean, no brainer if you can get them. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, dude, that's uh it's kind of like, uh, you know, you should have a plan, you know, mm -hmm. just like for, you know, your house, if you have a fire or something, like you should, you should think through the things ahead of time. Um, especially with as much time, money and effort that we all put into deer hunting, you should consider what happens if you don't put a good shot on, or if you don't see the deer go down, or if you don't have a good blood trail. Um, you gotta be humble there though. And I'll be yeah. guilty of it too. Like, I think I make good shots and maybe they weren't as good as I thought. You gotta be humble and assume that like, if you're not, if you don't see that deer go down, you know, or you don't hear it crash, likely that shot wasn't as good as you thought it was, you know, and just take air on well, the side you, of caution. Yeah, just you should err on that side always, you know, if mm -hmm. you're like, hey, I, I think, but I really don't know. Mm -hmm. um, you know, man, when you when you put a clean double lung on a deer, blow through, I mean, you know that that deer's 
dead. Well, and truthfully, like even if you are confident that the deer is dead, like I was with this deer last year, but maybe you're not the only one hunting a property, sure. uh, you know, you don't want to go in and blow the whole thing out. Out of respect, that's a huge thing. Just just call them in. Yep. Find the deer. It's like a, a surgical extraction. Maybe you can ease, instead of bumping through you know the, all of these giant bedding areas and stuff, maybe the deer's on the other side of it, and you can just come in from the other side, pull them up, and, and you haven't you know damaged the property on November 3rd. Nick, thoughts on selling your car and us buying a thermal drone? Uh, and or organs? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And or blood, actually, blood and semen? Actually, if you didn't fix your fuel gauge, we may need you to sell a kidney as How well. much do you think we could get for next kidney? Well, <laughs> Probably kid- not 18 grand. My kidney's in good shape. I, I did Kelly Blue Book my car the other day. It's not going to get us a drone. Not okay. going to get us a drone. No. No. Hmm. Hmm. Well. <laughs> Chance. We'll keep thinking on it. <laughs> Anybody got a knife? <laughs> uh, yeah, we'll keep working on it. But no, it, it uh, yeah, it does. I've heard several people, oh, I'm about $18,000. That's yeah. significant. It's pricey. Significant. And I mean, he's got a good business model, got a good brand. Um, and obviously, like his following's kind of shot up there. So, but uh, some things that I'm glad to see somebody else kind of on the side of like, where the hell are these laws coming from? Who's starting them? Where are these petitions at? Like what, what in the hell is going on here from a DNR standpoint with decisions being made that are very broad stroke with what seems like very little chance of input or, or even awareness that this should have input. Yeah. Yeah. I think I, I really respect, you know, how they've approached the, the like the business model, like, yeah, yeah, 550 bucks, like, you know, a face value people are like, oh, it's expensive. It's expensive. Sure. You know, but <clears throat> I mean, do the math. It, I mean, it's not hard. He did, uh, he did hundred trips last year, you know, times 550 is 55 grand, you know, times that by how many, um, I don't mean to be exposing Mike's numbers here or anything, but I mean, it's, it's a good business model. So if he's got 10 operators, that's half a million bucks. Half a million bucks. You know, and each drone costs you, you know, call it call it 20 grand. Mm-hmm. So 20, 40, 60, 80, 100 grand, you know, mm-hmm. in the first year, mm-hmm. uh, you know, if they're outfitting all these drones. And then I'm sure they have a ton of gas mileage and expense and stuff. So it's, you know, they're, I'm, you know, they're I don't know. They're making money, but it's not like hand over right. fist by right. any means, especially with the time commitment and the travel commitments and stuff. Yeah. I mean, it, they probably could charge a lot more for the service, you know, and people would still pay for it. I bet at some point, you know, not in a in a bad way for him. At some point, he'll probably be forced to. They'll go up. The demand will be so great It'll that it's like... It'll be 50 before you know it. Yeah, and and again, still worth it, you know? And, yeah. and if, you know, you don't have to pay for it. You don't have to do it. You know, you get on the ground and find blood or get a dog or yeah. do something else. Well, and dude, I think, you know, I bet if, if Mike could help people for free, like, he absolutely would. You know, mm-hmm. they want people to find them. But the reality is you can only help so many people. And, and the way to, you know... uh mitigate demand you know is, is you have to increase the price well and you heard him he kind of this is just like a, a kind of a passion for him of like flying you know rcs to now i mean he's a pilot as well yeah. um well, and he was a hunter you know before this so like if we can m- mourn see the, the first amish pilot mourn, I mean, that, mourn that's the death of his hunting season. oh no way no way yeah I mean, super first of all super interesting guy awesome business model Content has been fantastic. Like, I can't wait to see that continue. And and like I told him at the end there, the data that he starts to collect is like invaluable, depending on how he, he, he looks to share that with people. A lot of people watching his stuff too. I can't, I don't remember if you were sitting here or if you walked out to go to the restroom or something. I was saying that, uh, so, so we throw drones up for real estate to uh-huh. fo- photograph properties and stuff. I'll tell you, I had a guy who was on one of those slippery rock properties was like, Oh, you're that guy with, you know, getting the deer and stuff. <laughs> and I was like, no, I said, I'm with white tail properties. We're photographing the property. He's like, no, same, you're, same, you're, no, man. You're, no, you're the guy. And I was like, okay. <laughs> yeah. Say I'm the guy. He's like, oh, I do it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Takes his picture, tags Mike in it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> it pretty, uh, pretty it's funny. cool, man. I mean, it, it, really cool to see, um, excited for his kind of expansion ge- geographically here. And, um, you know, uh, be interested to continue to follow that. Also, we'll probably, in prep of, of you know, his next meeting, probably listen into that commission meeting here in a few weeks to um, see what ends up coming out of that drone part of it. Yeah. Well, and due to, uh, to the commission guys, like, if, if any of them listen to this or, or the wardens and stuff, it's like, dude, I... The wardens do. They've made comments. <laughs> well, we don't... Uh, <laughs> I mean, dude, we're not, like... First of all, we're not we're not bad guys. Like we're, we're not, not bad we're, people. We're not, we're not out to just like talk about 
these people like like behind their backs, nope. so to speak. Like, dude, I I feel like we've made every uh, uh you know uh, attempt to reach out, especially in our own state here of, of PA, and like we've had some of the guys on before. Yeah, and, and, and we can't default to like, well, if they won't attend our podcast, then they're hiding something because no, that's no, no, not no. always true. It's either. Not, I, I think a lot of it is, um, you know, it's not necessarily them as much as the higher ups is they they they're they're frankly not allowed. Like there's certain stuff sure. that they don't want to be put on a on a you know in a chair and be asked questions that are difficult to answer, which is the basis of our podcast is to ask and discuss difficult or controversial things. Yeah, that's well, it. And I think uh, I won't put the cart before the horse, but um, was that an Amish joke? <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, yeah. I'm glad glad you caught that. Thank you. Um, <laughs> So a lot of people are familiar with the Muley Freak brand. Yes. And um, it, it, he had a, a recent situation here with like a, 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 run, a run in with the mm -hmm. law, uh, as did, you know, the, the Bomars before that, mm -hmm. um, as did some friends of ours here locally before that. So like th there is, you know, in each each one of those situations is is uh unique you know mm -hmm. they, they all happen for different reasons and um we don't necessarily have all the information we don't know all the circumstances all no but uh we're, we're gonna have muley freak, freak on here I, I hope in a week or two to, to kind of talk through that scenario and and how he was contacted by law enforcement and how they're working through that um maybe show just the importance of documentation and like i think our hope with that podcast and with any of these conversations we have that include the, the dnrs or whoever is that like we're, we're not we're not bashing we're not doing any of that like we have the utmost respect for law enforcement um and we see the the value there but you know i think we want to emphasize that the communication uh both to, to and from you know just to, to open those uh i mean dude the fact that like they're voting on this drone thing in ohio and like i guarantee nobody's heard of that is like a perfect example of like hey it'd be nice to know you know we, we would well, like they we, don't they don't and this is where i will throw them on the bus they don't want you to know I, right. They don't want, they're not going to go out there and advertise it on a billboard and say, hey, come to this. Or they're not going to put it on social media and say, hey, you got to be here. Just like Pennsylvania did. And like they kept saying that the board meeting was coming up, but they, they didn't want all of these people to flood it. And I understand <clears throat> why, right? I mean, it's, it's a very emotional sector that we in the hunting outdoor community are in. Uh, and there's a lot of different stakeholders in it. But so they don't want you to know, but that, necessarily is not fair to have the full public input period um again who, who in the hell got harassed yeah, that that right. led to this banning where i mean if you're listening tell us yeah. who who are you and what happened because i mean we didn't hear about it <laughs> right it didn't see i mean obviously that'd be a significant thing if i'm in my stand and some, you know, anti-hunter is, you know, flying. First of all, that drone's going down. Bitch is going down. I'm shooting it down. I don't care if I have a bow or a slingshot. It's going down. Number two is I'm probably going to come kick your ass as well. <laughs> like, we're going to have a fight. <clears throat> yeah. And so who is it? Like. Uh, they don't exist. Well, see, but that's what I'm saying is, is in normal things, look at the number of, of signatures on petitions to get things to these desks. It's, it's thousands that usually are required to get there only to say, oh, well, we've already, no, we're not going to do that. So who are the thousands of people who have been harassed that said, hey, you got to ban these things? Yeah. Don't exist. No, I think somebody. It's an agenda. Yeah, right. So, yeah, so, somebody flopped it out on a desk at some point and they're like, this is what we're doing. I would look in the fine print too, because like most agendas, our government, there's other things buried in there that are really the main agenda of the look here but don't look over here so what else is in there well that's what is I, in that thing anything say about oh hey by the way no more cameras on public land or no more cell cameras on public land or recovery of deer using drones on ohio public land you know it's, what it's, else is buried in there though because yeah. i'm sure it's not as crystal clear of that that this is the only yeah. thing we're doing i think a lot of it comes from like uh fear of lack of control like so because this mm -hmm. this here is new technology mm -hmm. i think that probably the ohio dnr or, or whoever i don't I, whoever's working on they're looking at it and say like we don't have a way to regulate that like well, we need to we need to crack I, down i think that. it comes back to the public privacy thing and kansas used the same excuse they said you can't have cameras on public land because of privacy issues people don't want their picture taken on public <laughs> land 
with your private camera. That was the main excuse for it. I assume that similar reasoning is being done here. Well, you know, people on public land enjoying nature and stuff don't want to be, you know, videoed or photographed with these drones and stuff like that. What, and I don't know, I'm, I'm asking this, like, what is the, it, because it's public land, are you defaulting your right to privacy at that point? Because it's public land? I, uh, I yeah, I don't know. And it is, maybe sometimes you brush over that aspect of the conversation, but there is a, a massive difference between public lands and private lands in the sense of like how, you know, how people should be allowed to use And I only them. say that because like, let's say I go to, I don't know, the public courthouse, right? There's cameras in there. It's not my choice that they're filming me. Mm -hmm. But did I forfeit that because I'm now on public grounds in a public building? Mm. Yeah, that's interesting. I don't know. I mean, it, because that, that is what this is all circling around. It's circling around the fact that this is all of these things. They're leaning heavily on the fact that it's invasion of privacy, uh, which I call bullshit. And I also think that when it's public land, like if I'm peeing behind a tree and Nick wants to look at my wiener, right? Is, is he invading my privacy or I'm in public land? Like he can do whatever the hell he wants. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I can see the argument. I can understand it. Um, I don't know. It's hard to make everybody happy. Well, and and again, these are big, broad strokes of of laws that are having a lot of effects downstream to protect privacy? Question mark. I mean, right. yeah, I don't know. Well, and dude, anytime the government want, is promoting something that's going to protect your privacy, it's worth questioning. <laughs> Let me throw this out here. Small, <laughs> yes, small plot twist on it because we're active on it, and I've had people ask me about the TikTok stuff, right? Because people are like, oh, China, TikTok, China, TikTok, right? We are very active on TikTok. Um, you know, do I think that TikTok is taking demographic data and stuff? Yeah, absolutely. The government wants to shut down TikTok. Our government wants to shut down TikTok because they think China and Chinese communism government is collecting this data to use against us somehow, right? Mm -hmm. All they really want is the U.S. to have that data, Right. They're not, it's not like they're trying to stop everybody from getting that data. They just don't want China to have it. They'd rather have it. Sure. That's the fact. Sure. So like, don't, don't let the news stories and agenda sway you too far. The fact is, is yes, TikTok is collecting data. Very good possibility that the Chinese government is getting that data. But the reason our government doesn't want that to happen is so that they get the data. Yeah. It's not like they're just stopping collection of data. I mean, dude, look at the data collection that happens now, like now, just even on a Google. I mean, how many times you go to a restaurant and they're like, how's your trip to so-and-so? And it's like, it's freaky. Like they know everything. They know like, everything. every picture. Yeah, there, there is no information that's the like. Data yeah. that's the data war. That's That is society right now is a data war. And so, you know, <laughs> again, bait and switch, distractions, mm -hmm. don't get fooled. That's all I got. Till next time. <laughs> Later. No, wait, that's your line. Fuck. <laughs> Go ahead. You give your part. Uh, we'll see y'all next week. Later. <laughs> <laughs> Sing me. Oh.